Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, a podcast by Filecoin Foundation that explores the intersection of blockchain and the data economy. I'm your host, Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Michael Casey, who's a longtime journalist, author, and speaker in the Web3 space. And now he's here to tell us about his latest pursuits in the world of decentralized AI. Michael, thanks for coming on the show. It's always fun, Aaron. You know, done a few of these things together. You and I, <laughs> it's always a thrill to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so, Michael, most people are probably familiar with you from your time at Wall Street Journal or Coindesk or some of your other ventures, maybe your books. Uh, but please maybe give us a quick introduction um, and uh, maybe tell us a bit what you're doing with the Decentralized AI Society nowadays. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, the Decentralized AI Society, I'm the chairman of that. We, it is a, an association of companies, projects, protocols. Um, all the various players who are coming together to form this nascent thing that we're calling the decentralized AI economy, the ecosystem of providers of, you know, compute or, you know, the marketplace for compute or the, the guys developing, you know, decentralized AI agents and the technologies that enable that. And of course, um, the, the decentralized storage providers of which Filecoin is a member of Deus, one of the first founding members. Uh, so which we're very pleased to have Filecoin be a partner in that. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's bringing together um, that variety of players to essentially give everybody a, a bit of a helping hand by collaborating, by, by, you know, working together, sharing resources, sharing ideas, looking at things like standards and policies and so forth to basically be able to help the industry fight the centralized model, which has a huge head start in this. Um, you know, I think your audience probably doesn't need to have the uh, pitch made to them as to why decentralization is important in this space. But, um, you know, a lot of folks don't. And so there's a real effort to also use this as a mechanism to educate the, uh, the broad population, policymakers and others on why really we need to decentralize AI. We need to decentralize the models. We need to decentralize the ownership structure of the compute, everything else, because without it, we'll end up with this, I think, really quite dangerously controlled system. Um, and so it, it's that's why it carries the tagline, the operating system for humanity. That's the tagline we use for Deus. Um, it's really about coming together and, and making sure that we have a human friendly AI in the future and that we can, where we can, we use decentralized principles and blockchain technology to enable that. And we've seen a lot of people in crypto and Web3 move or maybe pivot into the decentralized AI space over the last year or two for various reasons and motivations. But you seem to be tackling this from a very different angle. Like you're arguing that this is basically a moral imperative that we need to decentralize AI. Uh, and that furthermore, that we need to do it quickly because the Sam Altmans of the world have such a, a massive head start. Uh, so maybe talk a bit about what's your your motivations here for for undertaking this. Look, I think both of those things are correct. I do see it as a moral imperative, and I do think it's urgent. I would say one other thing, though. I also think there's a huge economic opportunity in this. Like, I think that the guy that figures out, or girl, uh, how to decentralize uh, this this whole economy uh, is going to make a killing because it will become the the, the model to which everything um, migrates. And just one last point on that: I think that open intelligence always wins. Like, you know, intelligence and knowledge. Has never going to win if it's a, if it's under a closed system, and so that is what we have as an advantage in this space economically. Uh, it's just that we have to figure out all the other barriers to get to that world in which we do. But yes, it is a moral imperative because um, look, I, I wrote a book this year uh, with Frank McCourt, our biggest fight. Um, we documented in that book the real problems that we've created for society from the Web two model. Our view is that. The system that we created was essentially digital feudalism, that there was this new mechanism of control of human beings imposed upon us by really six or so gigantic platforms who were sucking up our data, and our data is who we are. It is in the digital age, the footprints that we leave, the connections that we build, the followers we have or, or we, the, those whom we follow, the, all of that social interaction, the content we create, it is a reflection of who we are. It's 
basically our personhood. And the idea that companies can surreptitiously gather all that, know more about us than we do, and then use it in ways to manipulate us is a very dystopian idea. And that's really what we built. You know, we being the web the society through allowing Web2 to get where it is. And we need to dismantle that. But at the same time, the urgency to dismantling that is all the greater because of the fact that we're moving into a much more fast-paced, dynamic version of, you know, data-driven software interaction with human beings, AI, right? The, the, this AI future that we're all obsessed with right now has suddenly become all the more urgent because we take the Web2 model and that level of centralized control over the data and, and over the users and put it into this you know, system, it's on steroids. The capacity to control us is all the greater. So there's the moral imperative right there. We break it all up. There cannot be singular control over us because you don't have the power to do that. That's it's a it's a, it's a democratic concept. It's it's a model of human rights. It's the idea that this is my digital property and I have the right to do what I want with it. And we can create all sorts of fascinating, powerful new business models around that. But we need to be pushing constantly toward a more decentralized structure. That's the the moral part of it. Um, and yeah, the urgency is, as we know, this thing is moving so fast. Um, I, I, I was quoted in, the, in CoinDesk today because, um, you know, they were looking out to see what people thought about the impact of the election on institutional investors. And is there still going to be, is there going to be institutional money or not coming into crypto, um, you know, after this election, depending on who wins? And I, I tend to think, yes, there will be, but it's really missing the point. The most important question right now is the fact that what is this administration, the next administration, going to do between now and four years later when the world of AI is going to be very, very different to establish the policy principles upon which institutional investment or whatever is going to be able to fund and develop these open systems? You know, so um, it's it's an urgent situation because, uh, you know, I looked at that and thought, well, four years time, four years time is a very, very different world. That should be the most yeah. important thing sitting on the desk of the, the, the next president right now is come up with a strategy for how you can really attack the centralization of our Internet for the age of AI. I don't see anything more. And when we're talking about decentralized AI here, we're talking about like collectively owned, collectively governed AI models that can aspirationally compete with the chat GPTs of the world, uh, you know, hopefully offer offer you know, even better types of uh, experiences and, 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 and products for the end users. And then uh, I think it was a great point you just brought up here is like you, you need sort of the, the, the policy kind of framework to be able to enable that sort of thing. Right. And there is a lot of overlap with some of this stuff and, um, a lot of what we talk about in, in crypto and blockchain and even open source tech, right? So just ha having policy a policy framework in place that's supportive of this type of environment. But maybe can you can you walk us through like what's the the roadmap for getting all this stuff to kind of work together? Like how does this all actually actually work, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> million dollar question, right? <laughs> it's it's a huge problem because it's the it's there's so many different pieces to it, Aaron. So I don't know what the roadmap is going to require everybody. Uh, at various levels, whether you know you're the compute providers, the policy makers, the uh, model builders, the developers of AI agents, the you know standards bodies, the um, the NGOs that sort of care about you know democracy and things, all of that is going to have to be brought to bear in terms of what this looks like. I mean, I can tell you some of the things that we're doing um, that I think are important, like we're exploring. Um, some sort of friendly relationships with some governments that might be interested in creating um, a, a sort of policy precedent, if you like, for raising money for decentralized projects, right? So just sometimes the thing is like you have to unlock is the capital. You know, mm. there's some really interesting um, new tokenized fundraising models out there. Morpheus, for example, it's sort of built on this staking as a funding means uh, development funding structure is, a, is one of the examples, Morpheus being one of the leading AI um, protocols. Um, and then 
then there's you know different ways of thinking about tokenized ownership of um, the you know basically data pools, for example, DAOs of data. Um, there is this tokenized compute ideas that we have out there, the deep in models that sort of say, hey, we're all going to get paid to use our devices and plug them into you know, training models and so forth. All of which, yes, to all the nerds out there, it is difficult and we need to figure that out, but let's put that aside. It will get figured out. Um, nonetheless, all of that is interesting, right? There's these great new um, ways for us to think about ownership funding, monetization that come down to much more collective ownership. But let's be real. Um, the um, $15 trillion is the market cap of the top six platforms, the top six companies in the United States. The, they are, That represents 33% of the S&P 500. And those same companies are the very same ones that basically dictate the centralized AI model, which is why they are you know, they've gone from 25% of the GDP of, of, of the S&P 500 to 33% in less than a year because of the absolute concentration of power they have over AI. $15 trillion is a, an enormous war chest because those their, their equity is essentially the currency which was they can acquire innovation. So we need to, like, figure out how do we battle that. Yet one of the, the ways to battle it is to flip the switch and change the model of tokenization to toward tokenization as, as a model. But the other is that we've got to bring traditional financial money into this. So getting back to the point about policy, I think there's an opportunity for forward-looking regimes to create. So Bermuda is an example of this sort of place. We would look to do something there perhaps where you could approve um, a – system that allows for uh you know an insurer to put money up against a decentralized data provenance model um and so that now there was an instrument that um could be used to trade off between a pharmaceutical company and somebody who owns a lot of human data human dna and other health data and allow that to happen in its privacy preserving way and create models around that with that securitize those pools, turn them into data instruments, get funders in, like try to be creative around some of the stuff that Wall Street guys, the people who built the CDOs and all, all those sorts of things, which we tend to think of as a bad name were actually brilliant inventions. It was more about the lack of transparency around, you know, CDFs and, and CDSs and, and CDOs, collateralized debt obligations and credit default swaps. Yeah, I still remember my finance. Um, <laughs> those things were actually, I think, brilliant inventions they just did not foresee the massive power grab that would come from expu exploiting the, the lack of transparency so there's really innovative things that could happen around um data defining data as an asset we talked about this at the filecoin event with michael clark on stage with you and i and he aaron um and all of that um i think could serve to unlock capital um, it, it could give insurers and then on top of that hedge funds and others the chance to put their money into data centers that are providing you know decentralized compute and the like so mm. we just need to be we need to need to be creative around what are the what are the wedges what are the actual um, forces of power that we can use to sort of create this sort of almost an avalanche of money and influence and politics into this so that Policymakers wake up to it, so that investors wake up to it, uh, and so forth. I mean, that's that's a just. It's not that easy, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you're giving me a little bit of a PTSD to 2008 uh, with all these <laughs> CDS and yeah, CDO I, terms. I, yeah, I, I always felt that like Blythe Masters was <laughs> correct. Uh, she didn't necessarily solve the problem, but she was the inventor of CDS, right? And and I don't think the CDS are to blame. I think the fact that we didn't know where all the exposures were that created all of that, that opacity was the problem. But anyway, that's yeah. Well, and Blythe Masters went on to being one of the the early kind of proponents of of blockchain, one right? Of the on, grounds on, that blockchain she you know, thinks for, might have solved the problem of two thousand eight. Yeah, by yeah actually, like, you know. Yeah, it's like the problems that you know she helped create. I guess you know she she, oh, came she up would with say these... that the rest of them created. Not anyway, right, right. Like, <laughs> I like that. Like, like, yeah, too. yeah. Well, to her credit, I mean, she was one of the first people to really one of the first yeah. real sort of name brand uh, people to be really a protagonist for the technology yes, back in the day. Yeah. So she was a little too ahead of a time in a way. Yeah. 
Um, so kind of on this uh, theme of concentra- uh, c- concentration of, of just money and capital and wealth among the big tech companies, I mean, it's not, not necessarily a new subject here, but we are seeing, like you mentioned, an AI arms race among a lot of these companies who are just plowing lots of resources into this for obvious reasons. And I want to get your sense on, um, is there an argument to be made that this heated competition between these companies you know, will sort of create a degree of like self-policing or balance or like kind of keeping these entities inside the appropriate swim lanes? Or does this competitive ethos really just lead to just like faster centralization, <laughs> essentially? Um, well, but I, is I, there... Go on, yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess like, is there is there an argument to be made that, that, that just all six of these guys competing with each other over kind of the future of AI, who's going to own AI? Is this enough to kind of keep everybody... Like it's keep sort of an equilibrium of sorts of keeping this like at least having some sort of modicum of decentralization, or is this are we just sort of hyperscaling toward toward centralization inevitably if if, if it's these big giants that are uh, kind of at the helm here? Uh, yeah, I think like the history of, of Web two tells us that it's not right. They, 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 they are competitive, uh, and one could argue that 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 highly competitive nature within it. Um, is going to force them all to to change, but I think really what they're fighting for is monopoly power. So they're going from an oligopoly to a monopoly. Is that that's the that's the race they're doing? They're not racing to break it all up. They're racing to be even more centralized. Um, you know, Nvidia is is so there's a battle in some respects between the who owns the device, right? If if we're going to have decentralized compute exist on all of our devices everywhere um which is really probably the way this has to go because how are you ever going to have open ai oh sorry stop saying open ai i use open ai with little o meaning ai opened not the unopen closed <laughs> company called open ai the most misnamed company ever <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know how are you can have ai agents that are independent and working for you, right? This agentic future we're all sort of talking about right now that is going to be sort of pinging constantly chat GPT and a large language model sitting in some database in Oregon or somewhere. And it's all coming from all over the world at once, right? There's just no way the internet has that bandwidth. And so we're going to have to push these things out to the edges. When we do that, who gets to control that? Right? Is it going to be Apple with it, its ownership of the device? Is it going to be NVIDIA, which wants to build the chips inside it? Is it going to be Microsoft, which will build the small language models or whatever, like different hybrid versions of the bigger ones that now are going to sit at these more localized edge compute environments and do it there? You know, So there is a huge battle for what that future looks like. Um, but that, I think, the way they're structured resolves in even more centralized control. So the winner is either Apple or NVIDIA or Microsoft or, or Google or whomever. It's not, they all go away. Um, whereas the real battle on something like that, that, that very example, is to say how do we tokenize that? How do we make it so that Aaron and Michael and everybody else, their device is contributing to this and they're the ones who own the development of that and the and the outcome of for it. and so that you know it's a um, th- that that's the only way forward because I, I think it is there's definitely competition but it, it's not, they're not self policing they're they they're really it's an eye for an eye they're getting even more concentrated if anything and there's no and look I don't think that that also ends up in being a monopoly because I think that they do tend to keep themselves in check to your point but all they do is maintain the oligarch- oligarchy it's a kind of a weird it's not an oligopoly because an oligopoly, of course, is three or four firms who all do the same thing and collude with each other. This is six firms who all do different pieces of the same structure. I mean, sometimes yes, yes there's competition between, you know, Google's Android and, and Apple's iOS, and there's obviously, you know, different social media platforms like YouTube that compete with Meta's Facebook and so forth. And AWS, you know, Prime Video competes with YouTube. So there's always competition on the same things. But for the most part, it's pretty interesting. They they own different pieces of the stack, right? Amazon is the is the storage. Um, you know, Microsoft is the is the language large language model via OpenAI. Uh, you know, 
Google is is the sort of the data accumulator, and it is also out there with Android being a platform. Apple is a device, and Video is the chips, etc. Right, so. It, that that sort of oligarchy can, can can persist for a while because they all kind of actually do need each other. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great point, Red. They're, they're not just these guys aren't all just manufacturing widgets at uh, you know trying to you know uh, outdo the other one on making you know widgets faster and more cheaper, right? They're all kind of competing with each other, but they all sort of have their monopolies on their own respective areas of the stack. With yeah. maybe the only exception really being you know iPhone versus Android. Uh, right. but even, but that would be the only real exception. Uh, but in the other sense, you know, in the other areas, like they all, they all kind of occupy slightly different areas and they all sort of need each other to like maintain their respective. Well, we, also know from, we also know from a lot of the lawsuits that there've been, there's been collusion, right? Like, you know, wow. Android's app store charges 30% on every transaction. And so miraculously does the Apple store, right? I mean, the, <laughs> what are the yeah. odds that they could have arrived at that same yeah, number? Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all very much. There's a lot of manipulative practices around this stuff. Um, and, and anyone who's come in late here, I keep on using with oligarchy, not, and I do mean oligarchy, not oligopoly. It, 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 an oligopoly is a, is a, this is a, this is control, right? This is political. So just to, just want to rate, raise that point. I'm, I keep using it. Do people think, does he mean that? I'm like, yes, I mean it. <laughs> um so moving ahead here uh i want to just ask a bit about how like how your campaign is going right you've been on this this mission uh this you know this uh centralized ai society mission for a few months now and uh you've been kind of doing a world tour and doing you know activations in different places and whatnot and um I mean, how is the message being received? Are, are people, uh, particularly among kind of uh, among the Web three community, uh, who would be sort of the, probably the lowest hanging fruit for this? Yeah. But are people are people grasping it? Or like, hey, like this this is definitely like where we need to be kind of deploying our like this needs to be what Michael's talking about is is kind of the end goal we need to be striving for, or is it still kind of you, you still kind of feel like you're the voice in the wilderness and and you know, like, <laughs> my guys like pay attention. <laughs> um. So. At a high level, everybody, it's been incredible. The, the positive response, people get it. And so I think that's, <clears throat> you know, this, it's been rewarding for me, validating for me. I feel like this is what I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm a good storyteller and I'm a way of articulating issues and I think bringing people together so that we can collectively talk about that as part of that. And so I'm certainly getting a lot of folks saying, wow, this is a really good message you're giving and I get it and we, and we must do this. I think the, the, the challenges that I face are a twofold. Um, so one is um, that, you know, just generally collaboration is not something that um, our community is good at. Um, you know, and, and I think we all talk a big game around interoperability and coming together and finding synergies and working together and, and so forth. And there's lots of examples of different protocols doing so. But I think there's an instinctive tribalism around like, okay, my token, that's all I care about, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 that that has its its you know equivalence in in I think it's it's you know we have a membership model and people are, are coming in as members and we're excited about that. But you when you do find the reluctance, it's like, okay, how does this help my token, right? Um, mm. and, and we 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 have a model for how that's we think that can work where we've got um, an accelerator system that we're building and a, and a funding a kind of a collective fund that will help to build and promote the accelerator uh, model around the specific platforms and so that they can support development on their protocols. Um, and I think, but the bigger point is to say, guys, look, this is really very important. We're not going to, we're just not going to win against the 15 trillion if we don't find ways to, to agree on common standards and, uh, figure out where the commonalities do lie on sort of policy imperatives that we care about and, you know, whatever the right um, standards of, of data protections are or, you know, whatever these these systems are that we could all benefit from, we need to collectively address that. And people get it. And we are getting a very positive response to that and, 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 and they're signing up, which is tremendous. But I'm saying that, like, what I find when the conversation gets difficult, it's sometimes the same thing. It's like, nope, um, it, what's in it for my token? How does it make my bags go up, right? Like, how does it support my bags? How does it? How do I get this token to rise? And and that's 
unfortunate. It's it's the it's a it's the crypto version of the very same issues that impact share prices and why whatever dude sitting in some division of Google can't sign off on a different model because they're all incentivized to, you know, make number go up. They need the share price to be higher. And that is a short term view because it's typically done on a quarterly basis, right? All the fund managers of the world are all held to those quarterly returns. Um, and so there's a very deeply ingrained economic incentive structure that drives us to make the wrong decisions. And it worries me that crypto is built on the same thing. I actually think that we're really going to need, if we're going to tokenize like device usage, if we're, we're going to have to really get away from the store of value, huddle my Bitcoin kind of way of thinking about tokens. That's fine for something that should be a store of value like Bitcoin. But if we're going to have massive transactions all paying for our devices and convince the Gary Genslers of this world that that is not a security, that is not an investment, it is a mechanism of collectively paying for the all the services that run on this, this jointly owned system, then we're probably going to have to put tokenomic designs into these things that deliberately prevent them from becoming easily speculative. You need speculative mm. components to it, but it's going to have to be have some sort of, in, I think, some sort of inflationary mechanism built into it so that, which may sound anathema to lots of folks in crypto, right? But like, if we don't, then that token becomes yet another speculative tribal instrument that prevents us from building stuff together because we're all focused on number go up, right? So there's a there's really got to be some bigger thinking here, and that I think, yes, to your point, is is a challenge. Like getting people to like give up on the systems that they're currently doing. There's a lot of money and interest invested in it, but there's also an enormous amount of opportunity to be had from winning this fight. It really, is there would be. Just it's you know AI is going to create more wealth than anything we've ever seen in history. Being able to own a piece of that going forward is the biggest bet anybody could be placing right now. I want people to see that and 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 just help us get across the bridge of these internal challenges so that we can we can all collectively fight for that that big opportunity. Yeah, that's interesting that there that there is this this kind of myopia even among you know, the web three community who sort of prides themselves on being like, Oh, we're disruptive and we're trailblazers and we're, we're forward thinking, but even still kind of run into the same level of myopia where it's like, well, how does this help me hit my, you know, OKRs for this month or whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's like, and it's like, well, guys, like you're missing the big picture. You're like, this is the biggest you know <laughs> economic opportunity in history that, that like we're, we have a chance to be a part of here. Uh, like what's that going to do for your token? Right. Like, who right. Knows? But, uh, but, but yeah, but to your point, like, I think I think there's going to have to be you know just more education around like the opportunity and like the the stakes. And I think you've done a really good job of kind of like laying out like what are the actual stakes, like what is what is that actually at play here, but also laying out the opportunity where and then once once folks kind of realize that okay, like this 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 isn't such an abstract concept anymore. Um, I would be interested in knowing. Um, have you been talking to like more of like kind of Web two like folks about this? Um, I mean, perhaps maybe more. Maybe like non crypto, but like open source, you know, Web two type po folks, uh, and like what's been the reception from these types of people that maybe aren't you know coming directly from the world of of, of crypto and tokens and all this? Um, I haven't had lots of in depth conversations with folks there about it per se. I have talked to certainly to people who are in the AI development world, and I'll say that that like there's a there's a typical skepticism around it, um, and I find that to be both self-serving um, and and sort of actually ignorant, um, and and the reason why it's self-serving, of course, is like if you're invested in you know a certain model of development, and here's somebody coming along and saying we should do it this way, then you're going to say no, that way doesn't work. Um, that's just standard way that people have thought about things when they live inside sort of constricted boxes, right? But the other reason why is is that I think that box is a mental box of um, mm. of constructed thinking, and Jake Bruckman at, at CoinFund I think does you know made me think about this, and I think he had a really good way of framing it is to say that like okay you have these LLMs that are built on you know the large language the foundational LLM, LLM models are built. Um, with a cluster of always the same NVIDIA H100 or now H200 chips 
uh, all configured around <coughs> the <coughs> the neural network structures and um, you know token models that each of these LLMs has created, um, and they're all done in the configuration of a centralized storage environment, like you know an AWS cloud computing structure, right? So we have to do that because that's how these three pieces all go together, and they're building everything mm -hmm. on that basis. Well, why do you have to do it that way? Right? What, what if an LLM was a very different thing? What if it what if it was not actually a singular monolithic foundational model that was answering every question? You know, it thought as if this is an open ended. Here is the truth, but rather you're building for a much more you know decentralized agentic environment where my LLM is, LLM is my LLM for one. And then what if the compute was built on a parallel compute structure. It didn't have to be done at once. It was broken up and it was done on a modular basis. And what if the storage could actually be, um, you know, different degrees of, of security around that? And you could you could create certain aspects of what your back end needs to be that could live off much more basic hardware and others that because of security reasons had to be in a high secure environment. You know, and then, you know, so all of these different pieces could be broken up and we could start to just like think outside the box and do things differently. And that's pretty much the story of disruption through history. All innovation has happened when somebody said, ha ha, I got a different way of looking at this. I'm going to come through the back door rather than through the front door. Right. And, um, and that's, I think really, that's not, I mean, I'm not an engineer, so I get scoffed at you. Like, oh, what are you talking about? You're not an engineer. You don't know these things. Well, sometimes the only thing is, well, I'm not an engineer and therefore I can actually think a little differently. <laughs> Because you, you have to just – so I don't know what the solution – I don't I won't build the parallel compute and, and I don't know how to build the, you know, a, 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 a decentralized, localized LLM. But I do know that anybody who, who can figure that out has got a huge opportunity because the, 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 the strictured thinking that goes with these existing models is, 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 is real. And I was telling somebody on the, you know, the previous podcast with Brett King today and – and I, um, I was thinking, like, you know, AI moves so fast that in a few years, to, you know, it's, it's already possible to think about the chat GDP model as a dinosaur. Right? It seems mm -hmm. absurd because we're still using Google and the web, which is itself going to go away. But, um, you know, we're now imagining very different structures already than what is existing in this thing. And so, you know, you've got the potential for obsolescence and redundancy to be there very quickly. So, you know, I don't want to be melodramatic, but like, you remember the the Big Short? Right? We talked about the the DS the PTSD yeah, yeah. two thousand and eight, right? The Big Short was the idea that you could never short the housing market, and 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 they did. Like Michael Barry just shorted the whole thing. What if the biggest short right now is is the six big platforms? Mm. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, because because ultimately there's a decentralized model that's going to destroy it. Like, what if they're all blockbusters? That are just about to get destroyed. Right. The Netflix of, of AI, which is not the great analogy, except that, like you know, or or what if you're the media industry? What if that's the media industry, the most powerful industry in the world, that's now been blown away by by the internet and by social media and everything else? So, well, it's, well, it's interesting to think about though, because I mean, it's it's a great point in that these things can become obsolete pretty quick. Like we've had ChatGPT for for what like two years now. And even still, like even just as you're mentioning that, I was thinking of like, yeah, like I I I, I tend to use ChatGPT as kind of like it's kind of like my boomer like you know LLM, you know, <laughs> like I'm, like I'm using Grok, I'm using Claude, I'm using Perplexity, you know, like oh ChatGPT, like who uses it's like using Facebook or something, like who uses that, you know, but <laughs> but like but I think it goes to show that look like a lot of these things will become inherently commoditized, right? And they do offer very similar services and. Consumers are always going to, I mean, there's no real barrier like preventing me from just jumping from using ChatGPT to using Claude or to like using Grok or to using, uh, you know, the uh, the new Eric Voorhees one that I can't remember the name of. Venice. Uh, his, uh, Venice. Venice, yes, yes. So the, the, at the end of the day, like there is a possibility of getting, you know, of getting like user adoption, like bootstrapping user adoption on these on these newer concepts, these newer models, these newer mm -hmm. types of models fairly easily if you can get if you can if you can roll out a good product right mm -hmm. so i think that's that's maybe the like there's not necessarily the maybe the same um i don't know, maybe, maybe this is a bit of naivete speaking here but it doesn't seem like there's maybe the same barriers to adoption on that front as there might be on like you know 
getting somebody to switch from like you know an iPhone to Android or something. I actually did just switch from Android to iPhone uh, just this year, actually after right, like so it is 15 years of using a Samsung Galaxy and I'm using an iPhone. But uh, it was a little painful, but you know I survived. But like anyway, but I think maybe what you're saying here is that this isn't this transition for the end user at least doesn't necessarily need to be so difficult, right? If we can just roll, if we can if we can just roll out the the right types of products with the right types of structures, people will hopefully gravitate towards it. Yeah, and I think AI can be an incredibly valuable tool in that, right? So I was chatting with somebody yesterday who's building a uh, a product that is going to be like a personal agent in in, in your home, um, and, but it's trusted, right? It's you. It's not. So think of like how we have Alexa, right? But what Alexa is is just a little microphone speaking to Amazon, and it's going straight into this massive pool of information, and it's just listening to everything that we're saying and absorbing it and working it back at us in this incredibly like centralized web two model. But what if that? What if Alexa, which is obviously the robot, but what if that same device was just yours? It was trained on an, on an LLM that is now extracted away. It's not taking any of your data. Your data is all protected, but it's going out into the world and doing things for you. And so they were showing me how they they moderated it to um, to now just do your Spotify playlists. Well, that's really interesting. So it, it knows from what you are saying to it all the time. I want to listen to this, 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 and that. And this is so it thinks about what your playlist is, and then it goes to Spotify and creates a Spotify playlist for you. So the data, the the the, the, the sort of barrier between Spotify and you is now defined by this device that protects you and but yet and yet is still able to get what you need. And then it goes and does it with, you know, your Google Home or it does it with what you know, whatever else other request you have for it to do. So mm. in many respects, the inconvenience that we face moving from, you know, a Samsung to, you know, a Galaxy, whatever, to a, an iPhone or vice versa, um, could be sort of resolved by agents that would step in the middle and just fix all that for us, right? It might mean nothing to get an iPhone now because all of that pain that you were talking about is now resolved because in an AI in the middle of figuring out how do you actually sync your contact list and how do you sync your calendar and how do you do all of this for you, right? So we could we could see interoperability become a much easier concept literally by not making sure that each of these siloed places become interoperable, but that our own individual agents are out there resolving all the challenges we face in the lack of interoperability and it just disappears away because they can do it all so quickly. That would be amazing. <laughs> That's well, all I can say. Pretty, think about it, it is imaginable, right? Because it's like it's not – it's like think about it. All you're doing is, is teaching that AI to make all of those difficult decisions you make. And to do it instantaneously. Maybe it'll, uh, I can get it to you know clean my bedroom for me and uh, make my go. bed. And, <laughs> you know, well, we'll yeah. wait for the, the humanoid robots you for that. Have guess, your right? enchilada, yeah. <laughs> or whatever the expression. Um, well, anyway, well, Michael, uh, really appreciate your time here. It's been it's always great to talk to you and and just to hear what you're working on, what's sort of percolating through your brain. And um, why don't you give you uh, any you know so give you t- uh, some time for some final thoughts here? And you know how can folks sort of uh, take the next steps here. What's what's your call to action? Obviously, join decentralized AI society. Uh, but then, I mean, how else can folks maybe take take their next steps on this journey of like really trying to figure out like there's a huge opportunity here. Like, how can I play a part in this? Yeah, I mean, get involved in conversations about it. Like, I think like you know anybody that's that's listening to this who cares about what we're saying, like, try not to obsess about your token. Um, think about how you could engage in all of the tokens being all of the solutions for this broader, broader mission. Um, I, I was talking to um, somebody earlier about um, the fact that, you know, what should we be thinking about now as we go into a new administration? As to, to, to remind folks, we're recording this before you publish it. Today is the day of the most important <laughs> election in history. Um, and, you know, I keep on getting asked, in fact, I was quoted on Coindesk today in an article that Aon wrote there about, Aon Ashrev, about, you know, like, what does it mean for institutional investment? Um, what, what will the winner of this election, what does it mean for institutional investment in crypto? And I kind of look, just, it's kind of not the point. <laughs> it's kind of like irrelevant. Like, not to say that institutional investment isn't really important in crypto, but the biggest question without any doubt whatsoever for the administration is the one that people aren't really talking about. And that is to say that between now, the year, 2024 
and 2028, when we have the next election, the world is going to be very, very, very different. AI is moving so fast. So any government that's coming into power right now and is not trying to think about my plan <laughs> for fixing that is is way behind the eight ball already, right? Which make, might make us feel very doomsaying because it doesn't sound like they have a plan, right? But But I'm just saying this to say we need to get – everybody on board to understand this you, you know, speak to your congressman speak to your senator speak to your you know your local town council whomever to understand the importance of self-sovereign privacy preserving data provenance based you know ownership of these ai systems that are just going to be so central to our lives in just a couple of years time yeah very well said very well said um well, Michael, really appreciate your time. It's always a pleasure. And thanks to everyone for, for watching and listening here today. And we'll see you next time on DWeb Decoded.